What is up, Outlap F1 Nation? If you're still up along with us, welcome on in. Uh, this is season six. This is episode number 16. I Hopefully, I'm only going to do this one time or maybe one more time after the break, but here we go one more time. It's the 2024 Formula One MSC Cruises Grand Primo del Made in Italy Emilia Romagna 2024 GP Review Show. Woo! That doesn't get your blood going. I don't know what will. Uh, you've got Andy. I'm along with uh, my esteemed colleague, Mr. Cody, tonight. It is good to see you, sir. Uh, thank you for joining us on a rather late night. We're recording this actually Monday evening, Tuesday-ish morning. I don't know how long this will actually bleed into it, but uh, it is good to see you, sir. Thank you for staying up late. But uh, how's it going and how you doing? It's going okay, uh, despite the fact that I didn't really have a whole lot to do this weekend. I'm I'm somehow getting less sleep than I normally do <laughs> because, you know, the thing about there not being anyone around, uh, like my uh, lovely fiance to stop me, is I'll just play video games all weekend and stay up until like three o'clock in the morning. So it's good that she's back. And uh, yeah, now I can actually, you know, have someone that's like, hey, should you really be staying up like this late? Don't you have to go to work in the morning? So you're saying you like structure and and that part of it. Yes. You know, every once in a while, <laughs> I stay up on that playing video games, but can't do that more than like a day in a row anymore. Yeah, to me, it's that those weekends are kind of like eating dessert. You love dessert, but if you have too much dessert, it makes you sick yeah, <laughs> type of thing. That's a great way to put it. Yep. Yep. Well, anyway, we're glad you survived the weekend, and we're going to get mm -hmm. into all of the uh, lovely Formula One action, in quotation marks, that was on during this weekend. Um, and if you're here, as David Kraft would say, welcome along. You can find our show, as always, Twitter, Instagram, Discord, Reddit, and YouTube, at Outlap F1 Podcast is the handle for all of that. Uh, you can see our link tree in all of our show notes, which will take you to all of the places that we are available uh, to be listened to and or watched. Uh, if you happen to be watching on YouTube and you like what you're seeing and you enjoy what you're hearing, uh, you can smash that subscribe button. Uh, you can also leave us a like. That'll help us out a little bit. Uh, and if you're on your favorite podcasting app, you can uh, click a five-star review, specifically Apple Podcasts or Spotify. All that does is help us get our content to you a little bit more quicker. Helps us come up a little bit more in search results uh, when people are looking for content of similar ilk. So uh, thank you so much if you would like to do that. Uh, you can email the show, as always, chat now at outlapf1.com. We'll take you there. Uh, thank you so much to our continued monetary supporters, including Dean Warwick, Yuri Dolchester, Paul Weaver, Quinton Warden, Kevin Kelly, Regan Stanzik, Timothy Brown, and, of course, Jonathan Scott. If you'd like to become a member of what we call the hashtag Outlap F1 Nation, uh, you can uh, find our link, uh, uh, not in our link tree, but it's in there. Uh, it's our anchor page. Uh, there's a support link in there. Uh, it'll take you to our anchor page. A dollar, five dollars, all goes into two things. One, either upgrading current equipment we already have, or two, uh, investing in some new equipment to help always try to make the show better. That's what we're out to do. Uh, final reminder, you can find our code OUTLAP with the good folks at Manscaped, and you can use that code OUTLAP, O-U-T-L-A-P, all one word. It'll get you 20% off and free shipping of their products. All right. So we will start out as we are apt to do with our headlines of the day. Cody, I'll let you go first on this one. What you got? My headline is thank you, Lando, for providing this week's entertainment. What little there was. Uh, yes, this was definitely not the most exciting Formula One race uh, that we've seen in a long time. In fact, uh, you know, I thought I was going to be all ready to, to get up at eight in the morning and, uh, and watch it. And after that late night playing video games, really hard to stay awake <laughs> because this one was a little dry folks uh but at least uh, i know for those last 10 laps or so uh the excitement did get dialed up because we saw what we thought was going to be uh, a fight for the win uh right at the end between max and lando yeah my headline is pretty much the uh the same noise that i seem to make many times during the course of the course of this weekend which was damn so freaking close. Uh, I kept finding myself saying that between the qualifying and then the race. And it was so close. But it's it's so tempting because the good news, even if this race wasn't necessarily the banger 
that you know we were kind of all hoping for. There's potential. There's a real fight going on at the front of this grid now, and it bears so much uh, fruit. Hopeful, hopefully, it's going to bear a lot of fruit when we go to some places that overtaking is a tad easier. Um, and yeah, so we'll uh, we'll discuss it and we'll get into all that in just a little bit. Uh, but so close yet so far. Uh, anyway, uh, so we are, we'll start. The good news is we don't have. 12 different sessions to talk about. We only have the regular qualifying and then the <laughs> race itself, uh, which it, this feels like it's going to be like podcast light uh, for us. But uh, yeah, exactly anyway, point, yeah. yeah, exactly. So uh, we will start with the qualifying recap, which saw. All right. Going out without setting a lap time as all of his were deleted for track <laughs> limits, which is kind of hard to do considering there's gravel everywhere. <laughs> That was the number two of Logan Sargent in the Williams. P19, shocker of qualifying here, considering all the upgrades they brought. Fernando Alonso in the Aston Martin. What is up there? Uh, P18 was Kevin Magnuson. P17, Zhao Granyu. P16 was Valtteri Botas. Advancing Q through to Q2, but going no farther. Uh, P15 saw Pierre Gasly. P14 saw Alex Albon. P13, Lance Stroll out qualifying his teammate. P12, Esteban Ocon. P11, other shocker of qualifying. Sergio Perez not making Q3. Uh, only in P11 for him. The top 10 from 10 to 1. P10 was Nico Hulkenberg. P9 was Daniel Ricciardo. P8 was Lewis Hamilton. P7, one of the stars of qualifying for me. Yuki Sonoda in the V-carb. P6, George Russell. P5, Carlos Sainz. P4 was Charles Leclerc. P3 was Lando Norris. P2, Told you when he got that upgrade package, something good was going to happen. Oscar Piastri and the other McLaren, and P1 with a time, lap time of 114.746, Max Verstappen in the Red Bull. I got to figure out this board, man. It tells me the loop is on, and I assumed it was on, and then it's now it's not. Mm, annoyed. But anyway, um, one of those things that. We'll figure out. So donate Don't to the show. The and us, yeah, donate to the show and help us figure out the the freaking soundboard. Um, but uh, anyway, Cody, big thoughts on the qualifying, which probably was uh, the highlight of most of the on track action. It was really nice to see just how close uh, everyone was at the top. Uh, you know, we've got Max Verstappen, Oscar Piastri, Lando Norris, Charles Clare, your top four, all within, I think, less than three tenths of each other for their, their best times in Q3. Uh, and it did come right down to the wire at the end where we thought that maybe Lando and Oscar uh, had a chance at taking that pole position. Um, sadly, it did not happen. But like you said, with McLaren, they, they came so close. The uh, result of this is we see Max uh, tying a couple records. I think he's got now uh, tied for most consecutive polls as well as most consecutive polls in a single season, uh, which is, you know, just Max continuing to, uh, you know, smash more records. Uh, it just kind of seems like another day in his life now. Um, also, as you said, a couple of big surprises there. Uh, Fernando Alonso not handling the car very well, pretty much the whole weekend. He seemed to be off the track quite a bit in practice sessions. Uh, obviously had a hard time putting in a good time for qualifying and Sergio Perez, uh, you know, quite a ways off from max this week. Uh, I'm hoping that this uh, is not signs of what is to come that we're going to get uh, the same thing that happened last year where he kind of fades away in the middle of the season. Um, probably a little too early to call that. So we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. Um, not a straightforward weekend by any stretch for the for the Red Bull team. Uh, the Friday running of what you know there was of what I saw, Max did not look comfortable. Sergio did not look comfortable. The car did not look fully dialed in. Um, so actually, kind of a great job uh, by Red Bull and Max to kind of pull this out when they were looking vulnerable, kind of from jump uh, to still mm -hmm. manage to put it on pole. So if you're if you're in that camp of oh it's just the car, maybe take this as kind of the evidence against that because you know the driver kind of has something to do with it and Max is really really good in case you hadn't noticed. Um, so yeah, I mean that was kind of a great recovery for them 
if you actually want to think about it in terms of the weekend, because it was looking, you know, if you looked at just the Friday running, you're thinking, oh my God, this is like Singapore all over again. You know, they can't seem to get their, their stuff right. But, and, and you look at Sergio, I always kind of say where Sergio is, is probably where the car legitly is probably. And then you look at the difference and it's almost a second. So, I mean, the driver definitely has something to do with it. Uh, and kudos to Max on putting it together when it mattered, uh, especially late. Uh, the McLarens actually brought it for, you know, both both Lando and Oscar, I thought, nailed their both respective laps. I don't think they had any more in it. And you're talking about less than a tenth. I think for between Max and Oscar, it was point zero point seven eight seconds. That's nothing. So they're there. They're in the fight. So at least that makes me encouraged as a, as a McLaren booster. But, uh, yeah, just Max doing Max things. He can, he can pull it out of the bag. You know, he's worth two, three tenths on his own. Um, but, uh, yeah, so kudos to Max on pulling it out there. Uh, one bit of post-qualifying uh, issue that popped up. Oscar Piastri, despite finishing in P2, I had to love his tweet. I had to love what his tweet uh, <laughs> afterwards where he's like, well, that was fun for a while. Um, did pick up a three-place grid penalty for impeding one Kevin Magnuson at the end of Q1. Uh, pretty much a team mistake. I think the team even admitted it. Uh, Neither McLaren driver should have been out there, if you if you ask me. They sent them out there on sets of used soft tires at the end of Q1 to basically cover to see if anyone was going to do dramatic track evolution, which did not happen, number one. And number two, by the time they actually got out of the pit lane, because that's where you build your gap now, um, they had no hope of making the flag. So it's almost like, well, why didn't you just shut the car down and let the crews come and drag you back? But uh, they opted to send him out. And because of that, K-Mag was on a flying lap. And, you know, it was in kind of that S section at the early part of Sector 1. And, yeah, Oscar impeded him. And what else can you say? I mean, he tried to get out of the way as soon as he could. It's not a thick racetrack. There's not a whole lot of extra room. I don't know where you're expecting him to go. But the team were not on the radio loud enough, probably. So it's, it's a worthy penalty. I get it. I accept it. But the fact of the matter is, I think McLaren dropped the ball. They shouldn't have been out there. All right. Well, that's it for the quality. Uh, so we will now move into the race. Look at this. We are flying through. Um, so we will start with our back markers. And those back markers saw the uh, Williams of Alex Albon get the dreaded did not finish after a really awful pit stop, uh, which kind of ruined his day. Uh, the other guy who just had uh, just uh, just a terrible day and a terrible weekend, Fernando Alonso in the Aston Martin, he finishes the race, but uh, does no better than P19 on the day after Aston Martin basically turned that into a glorified test session for him. Uh, P18 was Valtteri Bottas, P17, Logan Sargent, P16, Pierre Gasly, P15, Zhao Granyu, P14, Esteban Ocon, and only managing P13 in a V-carb that sometimes looked uh, pretty spicy at times, uh, Daniel Ricardo in the V carb. Uh, Cody, big thoughts here in the back markers. Well, it was uh, proof that it is difficult to pass at this track uh, that Fernando Alonso did not advance any farther than where he started. Um, I think Aston Martin kind of decided that, you know, he probably wasn't going to advance too much farther up given the way that this track is, and they decided also that they uh, they don't really have a good grip it seems on these uh, these upgrades that they brought to the car so they kind of made fernando alonso into uh, the test mule for the day uh, i think they put him out throughout the race on all three compounds of tires uh, yep. i believe kind of trying to maybe get a feel for uh, how the car was going to react trying to get more on top of uh, the car's performance it was one of those rare instances where uh, it seemed that Lance Stroll was just overall qualifying and in the race, the, the better performer. Um, I think that's going to be a common thing, uh, but it, it does happen on the occasional occasion. So uh, yeah, rough one for Alonzo, uh, you know, bad luck for Albon as well. Uh, you were mentioning his bad pit stop. Seemed like there was kind of a run of bad pit stops throughout uh, the feeder series as well. I don't know uh, if you if you watched any of the F2, F3 stuff, but there was uh, some instances of uh, tires flying off cars in the pit lane. Uh, it got uh, a little messy there. I tried to watch some of the F2 live, and I think that hits at like 3 a.m. local, 
And so I was fading in and out of consciousness. So I do have like an appointment to go back and watch some of that. I've heard, I heard the F3 sprint is crazy um, that I want to go watch that. And I've heard, I, I saw enough of the F2 to know where everybody finished, but I didn't see a lot of the pit stop work. So I'm definitely going to go back and review that. But yeah, I saw some of the melee and if, if you wanted to see cars off the track and into the gravel, F3 and F2 is where you had it this weekend. <laughs> um, yeah, other than that, uh, a lot of people, I guess, finishing here where we expected them to. It was good <laughs> to see at least Daniel Ricardo getting a little, you know, f- further up in the midfield here, I guess. Uh, but he sadly didn't finish as well as, as Yuki. Um, but yeah, everyone else at the back here is pretty much that uh, we got uh, the. The Alpines, which are, are kind of a stable here at the back right now. Uh, we got um, the, uh, wow, you, can you tell I'm a little tired? I am drawing a big fat <laughs> right here. Kick Sowers. We got both the uh, the Kick Sour cars uh, back here. We've got uh, both both the Williams cars back here. Um, uh, you know, these cars are the cars that could really use some, uh, some strong upgrades here. Um, we've talked about how Williams has got a, you know, put together some things with how the team operates uh, in the background as well right now, which may be why they're uh, they faded back quite a bit this year. But yeah, man, it's it's rough. It's rough for those teams right now. Yeah, rough at the back end and at a track where it was also very, very, extremely difficult to overtake, uh, especially just given the size of the vehicles here. Um, so we will move then into the midfield which saw Kevin Magnuson finish in P12, P11, Nico Hulkenberg, P10, Yuki Sonoda. There he is yet again in the points. Good for him. Uh, the banner waiver and uh, representative of the Aston Martin team this weekend was Lance Stroll. He comes home in P9, gets two points for the team. P8, only able to rally to P8 if this isn't an indictment on how hard that track is to overtake. Uh, Sergio Perez in the Red Bull, only able to uh, net three places in the positive direction uh, from uh, from where he fin- uh, finished up in qualifying. P7 was George Russell. We'll have to talk about the Mercedes interesting call at the end of the race. P6, Lewis Hamilton. Uh, P5, Carlos Sainz. And P4 thought he also deserved a better fate again. If not for the penalty, who knows what could have happened. But Oscar Piastri and the other McLaren uh, did get at least one of his three place places back to finish up in a strong P4. All right. Well, we, we did see uh, uh, at least a bit of a battle between uh, Piastri and one Carlos Sainz. Um, Piastri not necessarily able to get past Carlos Sainz early, but uh, did flip him over in the pit stops. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was uh, probably the easiest way to get around people on this track, I would think. Um, and yeah, he just you know missed out on the podium, like you said. Uh, it seems like Oscar Piastri is whole year so far this year has been like a story of what could have been like yeah. what if he didn't get the grid penalty what if uh you know safety cars didn't happen when they did and and whatnot so he seems to be uh continuously uh the butt of bad luck um and i really hope that that changes for him soon because we're seeing that he is performing very well um you know maybe he still needs to get uh, a better handle on tire preservation if if there's any critique of his style right now but uh overall he's a uh, very strong performer uh, definitely deserves that McLaren seat that he got into. Yeah. I mean, I, my, I am nothing but very, very hopeful to see what uh, can be done for one Oscar Piastri. Um, I'm also loving his uh, social media account right now. Um, he's been <laughs> just kind of on fire. Apparently he's looking for uh, excuses to, to, to say every race on the calendar is his home race. So if you're mm-hmm. a genealogy buff, Oscar Piastri would like to have, or maybe will contract your services. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, he's trying, I think he's ser- currently searching to see if he has any monogas blood in his veins. Cause I saw a tweet that said, I, you know, by the way, I'm three sixteenths of a percent of, of have Italian blood in me. So I'm using this as my home race now too. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's kind of been fun. Uh, him and Leclerc have been going back and forth this week, uh, at least after the race. So it was actually a good way to enjoy social media in a positive way. What, what a concept. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the Mercedes is, uh, you know, just kind of, this is just where they are. 
Um, whether they're just the fourth fastest team, then they're kind of kind of on an island right now on their own. Um, not really able to make any end roads. Curious decision at the end. I did want to want to bring this up. George Russell, who was kind, I don't know if he was just complaining. I didn't get enough of his team radio to know if he was just bitching and moaning about his tires. But Mercedes decide to box him with about 10 laps to go. And, of course, he gets into clean air. And what can you do in clean air and fresh tires? You're going to set the fastest lap. So he recovers one of the two points that he lost um, by going behind his teammate, but yet finishes 12 seconds behind his teammate. So are you telling me that Mercedes boxed him to have him go get the fastest lap to finish net minus one point? That don't make no sense. Help me understand this. I mean, unless George was really, really suffering on his tires, that's the only way that that makes any sense to well, me. He only he only lost the position to Hamilton, right? Correct. So, so really, Mercedes is netting as a team the same number of points plus one because he got the fastest lap. I guess you could look at it that way. As far as George's points itself, you know, for him, uh, it's. It's a, a loss of one, but the, the team still bags an extra point, which, as you said, no, I, I, I get that. But why then are you not <laughs> boxing the guy who's lower to get an additional point? Mm -hmm. it, it is, if, if this is because Lewis is going to, you know, Ferrari and we're starting those games now. That's going to be a very spicy garage. Like I know all of this not right with in Toto Wolfland right now anyway, but damn, if that's what that was, because I don't get it. But anyway, yeah, another one. Yeah, um, and then you know a, a, another positive. Yuki Sonoda, I thought had himself a, a really good weekend. Uh, at one point, I think he was in. I think Q two. I think he was P three or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely had some pace, could put it together, couldn't make it consistent uh, was kind of my takeaway of that. But uh, definitely uh, showing some good things for the V-Carb team. That is a team that's going to be annoying <laughs> to those top five throughout the course of the rest of this year. But uh, I guess we shall leave the midfield there. There wasn't really a ton of – usually that's where all the drama is. I wouldn't say that that's where the drama was. If you wanted drama, believe it or not, you had to look at the top two positions and really the top three, I thought actually had a pretty good fight amongst themselves this time. P3, Charles Leclerc gets Ferrari a at-home podium in Italy to the delight of all of the Tifosi that was there. Uh, P2, who suddenly found uh, the rocket ship uh, McLaren that uh, apparently and finally it just took a while to get from Miami to somewhere in Italy. Um, apparently it took 50 laps or something, but Lando Norris found some outstanding pace at the end of that race, but it wasn't quite enough to beat Max Verstappen in the Red Bull, a net difference less than a second, 0.725 seconds between the two of them. Uh, I'll take you through what I saw, but Cody, what did you see amongst the top two and um, was Max, a, would Lando have gotten him if we had one more lap? It's tough to say. I think, I think Lando would have been, I think if, if we had one more lap, the way we'd be looking at this race would be very different because it ends up being that Lando Norris couldn't quite get there. He ran out of time and nothing happened. Max just gets the win and everyone is happy with, with what they did. Obviously, McLaren probably a little disappointed that they didn't get the win. However, I think if we did have another lap or two, Lando would have been right there, and we would have seen the gloves come off because I don't think there's any way in hell Max would have just let him by. He would have been fighting hard for that, and Lando's got you know the taste of victory now, so he would have been fighting equally as hard. Um, honestly, it probably would have been really exciting and would have uh, kicked this race up from you know a you know, a, a three star to a three and a half star, I guess, <laughs> for me. But um, I personally think Max would have still taken the win, probably because he would have gotten rough and uh, did everything in his power to uh, to block Norris. Yeah, and and the other thing is, it was very difficult to overtake. I mean, we kind of saw in full view 
Oscar Piastri faster than Carlos Sainz, clearly faster, and not able to get a move done. Several mm-hmm. attempts going into that turn one on the, the main straight. Um, you did tell me actually in the pre-show that they shortened the DRS zone. What were they thinking with that decision? That one has me just, you know, just boggles the mind. A lot of other things I thought they did with the track of bringing in more gravel. Those are good things. And, you know, we didn't have nearly as many track limit things as I thought we were going to have throughout qualifying. So all that was fine. But you only have one really real place to overtake. You put the DRS zone back to where it is. I know we don't all love DRS, but God dang it, we need it. And this track Mm -hmm. definitely needs it. Or they need to find an excuse to have it somewhere else, too. Um, because damn, it was just really hard if you were quicker behind somebody, unless you were willing to sacrifice potentially your entire race, it was going to be really hard. So I don't know, you know, again, it's, it goes back to, you know, would Lando have won in Miami without the safety car? We'll never know. Would Max have succumbed to Lando with another couple laps? We'll never know. All I know is for most of the race, it seemed Max had a pretty comfortable lead. It was about I think at one point ballooned to like seven seconds. uh, And Leclerc actually was within DRS of Lando at one point on that, on that hard tire. And then Leclerc has the off and it was like watching the timing. It was like max super max went away and super Lando showed up again because it was taking half a second, eight tenths of a second, 1.2 seconds a lap. Uh, and he just ran out of laps. I mean, just the deltas were such that um, it was getting so close. And Lando, I thought, made a really good point in his post-race where he said, you know what, you're driving one way to get up to the back of somebody, and then you hit that dirty air wall. And it said it took him like a lap and a half to readjust his driving style to being in that dirty air, and by then it was too late because – I think it was lap six with two laps left. He had a bit of a scruffy um, Villeneuve chicane or something like that. But I thought listening to his radio, the key message came from his engineer, Will Will Joseph, that, that told Lando, stop trying to get the entrance to that chicane, but focus more on the exit. And it was after that message that I thought that really helped kind of key in Lando's pace and got him going again uh, when it looked like he might have even maybe finished his lowest third because Leclerc was right on him. And then, you know, Leclerc has an off. That kind of buys him some some distance. But then all of a sudden, you're like, you're watching this on the time. And I went, huh, that's interesting. He took like a second out of Max. And then two laps later, it's like, you know, nobody's noticing this, but that gap's under five seconds. And then the TV finally picks up on this. And then they they saw what, you know, we, you know, but it was just kind of interesting to watch just kind of how subtly it just kind of happened. It was just really strange. It didn't look like anybody was doing anything different other than maybe those tires just went through their graining cycle and then they hooked back up. But uh, yeah. Um, but if you are a harbinger of things to come, if this is a harbinger of things to come, pump this into my veins because there's a fight <laughs> going on at the front. This thing's going to get, they are going to tangle at some point. Um they- they probably will. And yeah. I it was so exciting watching Lando those last couple laps with how hard he was pushing the car. Like I was on the edge of my seat thinking he was going to wipe out because it was, you know, he was like kind of getting a little loose at times. It was right on the edge of the gravel. Like you were wondering maybe is he pushing it a little too hard, but you could tell he really wanted it. And with how close the qualifying was, it makes you really think uh, next weekend at Monaco, you know, is there a chance? It's another track where it's really hard to pass. Uh, we all know whoever gets pulled there has uh, a excellent shot of winning the race. And, you know, we've seen uh, just from this race, four cars that were right there. So I think, uh, I think in Monaco, it really could be anyone's, anyone's game. Yeah. That Saturday qualifying is going to be appointment television market now i will be there i am ready <laughs> i will have all of the screens and all of the timing sectors all ready to go it will be amazing um but yeah i mean that was probably the best part of the race was i would say the battle at the front between those three um so yeah i mean we've got there is definitely potential but max gets it done like i said that dude is not bad um to kind of 
I, I heard a good kind of comparison. It's like when you have somebody who's that good like Max is, you don't just get an advantage on him and think you're going to beat him once. you got to beat somebody like that like six, seven, eight times in the same event to really do it because he's still going to have that little bit that he was holding back a bit that he taps into. But I think he tapped into just about everything that he had this race. So, you know, let's see what happens. You know, it's definitely going to be interesting for things to come. But all right. And then again, as I did, I went, damn, so close yet so far. But anyway, good results, I think, for McLaren. They actually were the team that scored the most points of all the constructors uh, this weekend. So they had a very solid race for them, for sure. All right. So we will leave this race here. Uh, we will take a quick break. We'll re-rack. We will tell you where uh, what this round did to all of the standings. We'll look at the teams. We'll look at the top 10 drivers. Uh, we'll then open it up to my favorite segment, uh, the fan email segment, where you will uh, get some listener feedback on what they saw throughout the course of the weekend. We'll hand out some awards. We'll talk about predictions. Predictions are also pretty damn tight this weekend, too. Uh, and then we'll get into some final thoughts. We'll talk a little bit of it little snippet about IndyCar, but we're going to do that in our Monaco preview, but uh, talk a little bit about it. Uh, but come on back and we'll get into all of it. Welcome back. This is season six. This is episode 16. And one more time, in case you didn't get it the first time, it's the 2024 Formula One MSC Cruises Grand Primo del Made in Italy del Emilia Romagna 2024 GP Race Review Show. We're going to, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> we're done with that we made it, we made it. Uh, you've got Andy and I'm along with Cody tonight and we just wrapped up that Emilia Romagna Grand Prix uh, congratulations to one Max Verstappen on a hard fought victory uh, this weekend uh, so we are now going to look at where the driver and team standings are after this round so Cody if you want to do the drivers I will uh, come in with the teams yeah sure thing so first place is Max Verstappen he opens up his lead a little bit this weekend. Uh, he is up at 161 points. Uh, second place is Charles Clare. Uh, he's been very consistent performer uh, throughout the season so far. Um, so despite not having a, a win yet, uh, he's in second place for Ferrari with 113 points. And uh, this second, third, fourth is really pretty close together in points right now. Third place is Sergio Perez uh, in the other Red Bull car. He's at 107 points, so only six points behind Leclerc right now. Uh, and then Lando Norris, uh, about, you know, two races in a row, bagging really good points uh, for McLaren. He is at 101 points, so he's only six points behind Perez. Um, fifth place is Carlos Sainz in the other Ferrari. He's at 93 points, so not too far back to him as well. And then we have a little bit of a gap down to sixth place, Oscar Piastri who, uh, as I said before, seems to be kind of just getting some bad luck lately. Uh, we know he's got the talent, and now they've got the car, because he's driving that other McLaren. Uh, he's down at 53 points. Uh, seventh place, George Russell. Uh, you know, relatively quiet weekend, I think, for Mercedes. You said that they're kind of on an island right now in terms of performance. Uh, but he did get some decent points. He's in seventh uh, for the first Mercedes with 44 points. And then just behind him, his teammate Lewis Hamilton in his last year with Mercedes uh, in eighth place, currently at 35 points. Uh, ninth place, dropped back a little bit at, uh, after this race because Fernando Alonso had a bit of a stinker this weekend, uh, but he is still hanging out uh, with, with decent points. Uh, he is in ninth place uh, with Aston Martin at 33 points. And then wrapping up the top 10 is Yuki Sonoda, uh, pretty much sneaking into that 10th place, ninth place whenever he can. Uh, to continue to bag good points for uh, the V-Carb team. Uh, he has 15 points so far. Yep. Being just annoying to be there and in the picture. So good good on you, Yuki. I enjoy, I'm, I'm actually quite enjoying his driving this, this season, uh, for sure. Uh, all right. So as far as the team goes after, after this round of the F1 season, Red Bull Racing powertrains, no shocker there. They are in P1 with they are up to 268 points. Uh, P2 is Ferrari. They check in with 212 points. P3, McLaren Mercedes now fully entrenched in that P3. They are up to 154 points. P4 is the Mercedes Works team. They check in with 79 points. P5 is the Aston Martin team. They're on 44 points. P6, Red Bull, or the V-Carb 
team, excuse me, Red Bull Honda RBPT, which is the B-Carb team. Uh, they check in up to now 20 points. P7 is Haas. They remain on seven points. P8 is Alpine with the solitary one point. And P9 and P10 are Williams and Kicksauber, respectively, both on zero points. All right. So you have now heard our takes on the weekend. We are now going to open it up uh, to my favorite personal segment, the Fanny Mail segment. Uh, we've got our good stuff from a lot of our normal contributors. We've got a new one, or one who only contributes every once in a while, but it's good to see all that. Good traffic here. Uh, Cody, it's your time to shine, man. What you got? All right. Our first fan email comes from Rachel Fleming. Thank you, Rachel. And she says, well, that was a race, which I firmly agree with. Um, I, I think when the commentators kept mentioning the 100% chance of a safety car, I knew this race was doomed, uh, barring those last couple laps. Uh, it's a very poor race weekend uh, for the older guard of Hamilton, Perez, and Alonso. Uh, that will bring loads of comfort for the Ferrari fans at Imola seeing Hamilton uh, lock up and go off. Uh, comfort for now, maybe, but he's going to be that Ferrari driver next year, so I think they probably want to see good stuff from him. Um, but I suppose it could be worse. Uh, they could be Williams. Uh, I mean, good God, that was such a poor mistake with the pit stop that led to an absolute disaster all around, including a stop-go penalty and having Albon stuck on the mediums for half the race. Uh, hard to see how it could have been worse. However, I promise I will be positive. And Yuki again gave a good performance. If Audi cannot get signs, Yuki could be an option for them. I see more potential in Yuki than Botas and Joe, uh, but that's just uh, their take, or just Rachel's take. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rachel. Um, I definitely agree that it was a race. Um, definitely not a banger. Um, but uh, at least we did have that little bit at the end. Um, I didn't even really think about it that uh, on two fronts there that, yes, it was kind of the uh, the older drivers of uh, Hamilton or more, I guess, tenured drivers of Hamilton, Perez and Alonso uh, that performed poorly. Um, it's also a little weird to think, I guess, of Hamilton and Perez being among the old guard. Um, but man, I guess like Alonzo for sure. Like Alonzo was, you know, hitting his heyday when I was uh, still like a, like a teenager. But, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. It's kind of weird to think of Hamilton and Perez being uh, kind of in that same group now. Um, yeah. Bad, bad one for Williams. Not much else to say there. And uh, yeah, we already said that we're uh, we're very impressed with Yuki ourselves. Um, he's been much more consistent, um, I think, as time has gone on, which, you know, is, is I think, a, a natural course uh, for drivers. They get used to driving Formula One, they get used to the cars and how things go. Um, but Yuki, you know, starting out in Formula One seemed to be really hot and cold. Like some, you know, some days he was awesome and some days he was just nowhere. Um, driving the car off the track, having back qualifying. And just, yeah, I think last season and this season, he just seems to be uh, finding that consistent groove. Uh, he's best friends with like that 9, 10, 11 place. Um, and that's, I think, really the best he could squeeze out of that car. Um, it definitely makes him a good option uh, for other teams uh, looking to fill their seats. And there, there's a lot of that right now. Everything's up in the air right now. So uh, who knows? He might have his name in the ring. Yeah, I mean, doing what he's doing to to put his name out there, um, definitely adding to a ever now more impressive CV, as it seems every week that goes by, which is good and which is exactly what he needs to do. He's either going to put pressure internally at Red Bull slash V Carb uh, for one of those, you know, the merry-go-round of seats, or if he's like you mentioned, you know, he needs to seek uh, employment elsewhere there's definitely some good viable options that are around that will either be a slight update for him or potentially, you know, give him the potential to, to maybe do some more scoring. Um, so he's definitely doing everything that I think he's being asked to do. Uh, so that it definitely is, is a positive thing. Um, yeah. Whenever commentators mention a hundred percent chance of a safety car, it's kind of because, you know, they kind of want to see one. This was also the first bone dry Imola weekend since it's come back to the calendar and I think that when it, I remember when it came back to the calendar, my first thought was, Ooh, I like that track. It's going to be really hard to overtake there. It's going to kind of be like Monaco, maybe even a little worse. And yeah, that's kind of sort of what happened. It only took three years to have it happen. Um, 
But, you know, Rachel, to your comment about, you know, uh, poor old guys not doing so well, I guess that's very true. I mean, Hamilton, kind of his weekend was meh, not great, not terrible. Perez, yeah, did not have a very good weekend, and neither did one Fernando Alonso. Um, I think the both of those guys were struggling to get on top of the various updates and upgrade packages and kind of struggled, I think, more than they anticipated with car setup. Whether or not that's going to continue throughout the course of the next few races, that will be kind of the determining factor. I mean, you can kind of put Monaco and put that kind of off to the side, but it's after that round that, you know, things will kind of get more interesting and we'll have to see kind of what these update packages for both those teams really have, if there's any potential there. Um, Yeah, I mean, really rough race for Williams across the board. I mean, they're not able to bring the updates as everybody else is doing. Why? Because they were spending time building the third chassis. You know, this is the domino effect of doing the risky thing that they agreed to do. And it obviously never paid off when you had both guys wrecking the car in the third round of the championship. So, you know, this is just, it's just kind of a house of pain for them right now. Hopefully there is a way out of this, but it may be a long season for both you, for both Albon and of course, Logan Sargent, who at least managed to keep it on track for most of this weekend. Um, except during the qualifying where apparently he found all of the track limits on a course that has gravel traps after the track limits. But uh, anyway, at least, you know, managed to do that, but you know, it was a better weekend, I think on par for, for Logan a little bit here. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of all I got for you, Rachel, but uh, thank you again for the lovely email. Appreciate you hopping on when as quick as you do, uh, feel free to continue to do so. Yep. Thank you, Rachel. And, uh, our next email comes from the formula and they said, uh, great race for Lando and McLaren, arguably even better than last, last race because he almost won without a safety car break. Uh, I'm excited to see some stiff competition for Thanos to deal with moving forward. Overall, though, that race was harder to watch than uh, a Sergio Perez qualifying lap. Oof, man, sick burn there. Um, (laughs) I agree with Karun that the circuit needs some adjustment uh, to be suitable for F1 cars to overtake. Uh, Finally, it's great to watch a race live again, done by 9.30 a.m., and I can get on with the rest of my day. Uh, Yes, thank you, uh, the formula. And I I agree with the, the... race being at a normal time. The the middle of the night races are kind of an odd one for me because I'm a little bit of a night owl, but they tend to be at that weird time where it's like when I would be going to, to sleep, like, you know, midnight, one o'clock in the morning. So it's like, I have a hard time staying up for them. I have a hard time getting up for the 8 a.m. ones and even worse for earlier though. So uh, yeah, Sunday's the day to sleep in, man. So um, it is nice, though, that uh, you get up for these, you watch it, and uh, you still got the rest of the day to do things. Um, man, Sergio Perez qualifying lap, yeah, definitely a good burn there. Um, and this race was hard to watch at times. Um, I I got up for it, had a little bit of a hard time staying awake throughout the whole thing, just because there wasn't a lot going on. And then I got snapped awake by uh, Lando suddenly, you know, fighting for the win. So at least we had that. But um I definitely agree that I am I'm looking forward to someone being able to take on Max on the regular. And it was really, um, really good to see uh, that everything was this close, like you said, without the safety car break. Because after after Lando won that race, there was so much talk about how would he have really been able to do it without that safety car? I mean, yeah, he kind of pulled away there at the end, but Max's car was damaged. So how much of an effect did that have? And you really couldn't make that argument for this race. I mean, even Red Bull had brought some uh, some upgrades to their car. So I was a little worried that they might start opening up a gap again. Um, but instead, yeah, there was, you know, nothing crazy in this race. Nobody, nobody got any damage to their cars in weird ways. No safety cars, nothing like that. And yeah, it was extremely close there at the end. So I'm I'm looking forward uh, to the season now, um, and hoping that you know we're going to get to see some uh, some tight fights at the front. Yeah, I mean I am now mega excited for places like Austria, Silverstone, Spa. Even I mean these are, I think those are three tracks where I think if Max and Lando are kind of off even in, in their own little private little battle. Um, where they're going to be able to do some fighting and it's going to get 
probably a little more gnarly than like it, it's not going to be it, it's fun now it will stop being fun for the both of them i think sooner than later um mm -hmm. and then the smiles will go away and then then we'll watch the the psychological warfare of what teams do and i know zach doesn't get along that great with christian so there's all of that to come so he doesn't keep get along tuned. well with christian horner i i don't know who does anymore other than maybe some red bull shareholders of which whatever i'm not gonna go there but anyway <laughs> um yeah i mean i think right now it's I am ready to declare Lando and McLaren an official foil. They're not an opponent yet because Max has this just this ridiculous amount of high ground in the standings, as we just kind of talked about. But if Lando can be clipping at his heels every other weekend or every weekend, and it's going to force Max to, one, not just walk away and waltz away with an easy, cool-as-you-like victory, but, you know, two, have to pu push and earn it. And And here he did. And it's because of this upgraded McLaren car, plus the two drivers, plus good teamwork across the board for the most part. The only negative, I think, for the McLarens all weekend was having Piastri out there at the end of Q1, which just don't do that next time and you won't get a penalty. But, you know, <laughs> realize kind of where you are. But that's really my only, as a McLaren fan, the only thing that I was angry about all weekend with them. But other than that, you know, this is fun. Our team is good again. Uh, it's time to actually get excited to see what these guys can do for the rest of this year and then just roll that right into 2025, reset the points, and let's go. Let's mm -hmm. go. Yeah, 2025 uh, is going to be another great one, like at the end of the, the reg cycle when everyone's starting to reach that performance plateau and, and starting to really close up. I'm, You know, I don't want to jinx it. I think this season has the potential to still be really exciting, but I, I do think... Uh, I do think next season is going to be uh, really close and, and a good way to w wrap up uh, this uh, uh, package of cars. Um, so, uh, yes, thank you, uh, The Formula. I always feel weird saying it that way. Um, <laughs> I just call uh, it Mr. Formula. Mr. Formula, that works too. Um, our, our next one comes from Dave Doherty. Thank you, Dave. And he says, uh, your thoughts on Perez uh, since this weekend has been a symbolic one. What is going on? And your thoughts on Albon's race as well. Yeah, so it, we always, you know, go back and forth on, on Perez. And yeah, he looks good now. He's going to stay in that seat. Oh, he looks bad now. He's going to, is he going to lose that seat? And it's just a, a fact of he's been in the seats for a few years now. He's, you know, performed well when needed and has been, you know, probably not. I would say the highest performing prospect for that seat, but Red Bull hasn't needed him to be. He's done well enough. Uh, he was good enough to finish second in the points last year. Um, and that was especially, uh, you know, great considering he had some performances that we were all wondering if he was going to keep the seat, he still finished second. Um, but they only needed him to be that good because the car was fantastic. Max was winning everything and, you know, marching off into the sunset and they just needed him to be good enough to uh, clean up when Max couldn't be there, uh, which he did on a couple of occasions and, uh, you know, help them achieve the, uh, the constructors championship. And I think now that, now that other teams are closing in like McLaren and Ferrari, they're they're really going to be looking at that second seat more and being is is he performing good enough to keep us ahead uh, as as these teams are getting better. Um, I think so far this season he's done well enough. Um, I don't think they're going to want to before the before the new regulations come into effect. I don't think they want to tip the boat too much with drivers if they can help it, considering there's so much other crap going on in the team right now. Um, and I, I do think Perez is, is good enough still. Um, and I like Perez a lot. I, I, I really hope he, you know, continues to improve and do better there and, and solidify his place there. But Red Bull does have a lot of, uh, you know, prospects that could take that other seat. You know, there's been links to Carlos Sainz, um, down in V-Carb, you've got Daniel Ricardo and Yuki Sonoda, who I'm sure would love to have that second Red Bull seat. Um, we've got 
Liam Lawson, who I don't think would jump right into the second Red Bull seat, um, but he probably wouldn't be more than a, a couple of seasons off. So, um, yeah, I guess that's uh, that's my long way of saying my thoughts on Perez. And I think he's he's had a bad a bad weekend this weekend. Yes, that's true. He didn't qualify very well, but you gotta you know take that with the grain of salt. That uh, you know new upgrades. Uh, even Max wasn't super comfortable with the car uh, throughout the weekend. And on top of that, uh, we've already established it was very hard to pass here at Imola. Um, had had it not been so difficult to pass, he might have been able to to have a more decent recovery drive, um, and you know at least make it up into the top five, I would think, um, and actually, uh, you know, get some decent points. It's just kind of a side effect of the track here as well. So I'm not really ready to to write him off yet. Um, if you got anything to add on Perez, or if you want to take Albon. Um, I think you've said pretty much just about anything I probably could have on Sergio. I mean, it that seat is the double-edged sword that it is. I've always said that, you know, being Max's teammate means you are always compared against Max, and there is no room for error, and they don't let you fail at Red Bull Racing. They just don't. You either are executing or you're gone. I've already seen the article come out that says, well, we certainly hope that that was just a blip, because if it's not... You know, there's going to be more pressure on that seat. Well, of course there is. You know, it, Red Bull hadn't haven't needed a second seat to be really there. It's just kind of been something that they can have. It was more a luxury than a necessity. But now, if the gaps are coming down and you have two quick McLarens to worry about and two quick Ferraris, you know, who were also right there as well um, to worry about too. Um, yeah, that now you need that second gunner to do things and to be there for strategy and to be a rear gunner and to help score points, um, you know, to offset some of these other teams from gaining. Now, they have such a lead in both the constructors and the drivers right now that they can afford some one offs like this one, but that's only going to run out. I mean, you still got what? 18 how many rounds we got left to go 24 in the year so there's a lot we're, we're seven in so we got 17 left to go so there's still plenty of opportunity if it becomes you know more than a one-off if this becomes a trend if he is scoring single digit points in two or three races in a row i don't know who's going to be the one that comes out and says it but somebody's going to put some pressure on that second seat especially given the merry-go-round that's still far from settled and, you know, you just look at the other driver in the Ferrari, I think he's going to have a big say in who who's, what, who settles where. Because I think that's the linchpin that's going to, once that domino goes, you're going to watch them all go. Uh, kind of almost in succession, because he's either the plan A for somebody, or all these other teams have their plan B and plan C, and the contracts are basically written up, but it's just, well, who do we, who are we divvying them out to? It's going to be like, a, like cards, man. It's going to go crazy. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, so that's kind of my thought on where Perez is. Um, is for, in terms of Alex Albon, just a rough day at the – rough weekend at the office, really, if you're a Williams, because that car isn't be, hasn't been able to get any of the upgrades that they would have probably wanted to give it um, because they've been so busy building that other chassis. Maybe now the team can actually focus back on and try to get an upgrade package through and into the car. We know that that could take anywhere from six to eight weeks, given what all these other teams have done and how they've gone about their upgrade plans. And that's do they have enough money in the cost cap and in their budget to still do that? So, yeah, it's it's definitely a, a house of pain. But, I mean, in terms of this race, yeah, just a bad pit stop. Didn't get the wheel on enough. Lucky that he was able to bring it back, you know, but that's an a easy open and shut. You didn't have four wheels attached to your car. Um, so yeah, he gets the stop go and that kind of ruined his day. And that was kind of the end of all she wrote for, for the Williams team here. All right. So our next email comes from Jenny Donahue. And I like this question because I think it is something of a harbinger of things to come. And she says, any guesses on how long Max and Lando will remain air quote close friends now that Rando is actual competition for Max. I'm guessing Max will show his true colors per usual when things aren't handed to him and it will get ugly fast. Any thoughts? Uh, I think I've already kind of said this. I'm pretty sure at some point it's going to stop being fun. Right now, Max is happy that he has somebody who can actually race with. Um, 
the second Lando crosses him, and we haven't seen that happen yet, we're going to find out what other side of Max, if that other side of Max comes out. So far, the only person that's ever truly brought that other side out has been Lewis Hamilton. Um, and that was pretty much an equal machinery when they were going at it, ding-donging back in 2021. Do we see something like that happen again? Now, it's going to help that Max has this very nice, almost 60-point lead right now on his buddy Lando Norris. But Lando's form in the last three races has been P2 in China, P1 in uh, Miami, and P2 here. So uh, that is going to slowly maybe even erode a little bit. But I don't think it's going to get really spicy until if unless Lando can get within 25 points because that's a Grand Prix distance. Um, but if that happens, yeah, I would expect a pushback from Max. He's not going to give it up without a fight. This is a guy who's got stuff in his toolbox, too, for psychological warfare, and uh, he will deploy as needed, I'm sure. Yeah, I think it'll start to get ugly the first time that they are truly, you know, like on track competing for the win. And some, you know, inevitably someone's going to force someone else off the track or they're going to collide or something. Um, it is, you know, there's something to be said about the fact that it seems like they enjoy uh, each other's company um, and are friends uh, off the racetrack. But you know, a lot of I've seen a lot of commentators bringing up that uh, Lewis Hamilton and Nico Rosberg uh, used to be friends um, before their time at Mercedes, and that eroded very quickly once uh, you know the championship was on the line and there's true competition between them. Um, I see something like that happening in this instance too. Hopefully, they can just compartmentalize and separate what happens on track versus what happens off track. But the thing about Formula One or really any uh, you know, pinnacle of sport is, you know, there's so many people that want to be in Formula One. There's only 20 seats, right? So I feel like to to be in Formula One, you really not only need to be a top performer, but you need to really be kind of ruthless uh, in order to, to get and maintain your seat there. Uh, and I think we're going to see that side come out of probably both of them. Uh, once the competition gets that close, we've already seen that Max can be quite ruthless, um, uh, you know, during his uh, really close competition with Lewis Hamilton and, uh, you know, with his teammates and whatnot. And, uh, you know, Lando, uh, I, I don't know if we've seen quite uh, such an explosive side like that with him yet, um, but he's got what's going to be a very competitive teammate himself with Piastri, who will probably start to bring that that side of him out. And if he's, you know, fighting for wins and hopefully in the next come couple of years here, championships, I'm, I'm sure both of them will, uh, will start to uh, be at each other's throats on the track. Yeah. I mean, at, at this, I still think we're in the, it's kind of cool that you're up here, Orlando phase. And mm -hmm. that will, that will wear thin the second that, like I said, once, once, once there's contact between the two of them, once one crosses the other, you know, we didn't get a chance to really see. I thought the only really, the truly disappointing part of this race is they both got a good launch off the line, but we didn't get a chance to see Lando equal with Max going into that turn. Max was clearly free and clear of Lando there, even though Lando was pushing to try to get there, uh, just didn't have it. And then, you know, just fell in right behind him. So that was kind of all of the the, the close of the clashing ish that we, that we ever got here. We never saw what would have happened if there was another lap, if Lando had gotten into DRS and, you know, what could have or potentially would have happened there. Uh, and we never saw Max had to defend, really truly have to defend. Like he was there by the time he got there, there really wasn't a whole lot Lando could do other than try to maybe get Max um, to either do another track limit, which, oh, by the way, Max was on his third strike which I don't even recall ever seeing that message, but apparently it was there because I saw the FIA document that he was on his third one. So he'd been shown the black and white flag. And had he gone off one more time, that would have been a five second penalty. And that, you know, would have cost him race. But, uh, you know, if it's not something like that and it's going to cause, you know, a real, real on track thing, like, like I said, I think Silverstone could get spicy starting in P2. You definitely have a chance to, to lead the race. Um, 
you know, the, the racing between the two of them has always been pretty cordial up to this point, but uh, Max has known he was in a quicker car all the last year. And Lando also knew that Max was in a quicker car. So I don't think they had a knockdown drag out fight. Well, I think that's on next time. So we, she will stay tuned and we shall see. All right. Well, thank you everybody for uh, your contributions to the show. Like I said, it's always fun to react to uh, what you guys are seeing over the course of the weekend as well. All right, so we will get into our awards. We will start as we normally do with the Rubbish Award. Uh, so, Cody, I'll let you go first here. What you got? My Rubbish Award is going to go to Fernando Alonso. I really don't like doing that because I really like Fernando Alonso. I like his don't take shit from nobody attitude. Uh, but, yeah, this this weekend is definitely one to forget for him. Um, Qualified very poorly throughout the weekend. Didn't really seem to have uh, a handle on the car. Was off the track uh, many times. Uh, and then, yeah, pretty much stuck there at the back in the race and uh, ended up making it into uh, an additional test se- session. So, uh, yeah, definitely uh, uh, one to uh, to put behind him. Yeah, mine, mine is kind of in the similar vein as yours, where it's seriously, what is up with Aston Martin? Uh, This is also one of those stories that's no longer becoming funny where, you know, they were kind of at the bottom of the top five. They brought what we knew when we talked about in our preview was going to be a serious upgrade package. And it obviously did not work as intended here. Doesn't mean that it won't work as intended in other places necessarily, but I've already seen the article that says that Lawrence Stroll wasn't pleased. And now we have two egg timers that are now ticking. You have the Fernando Alonso egg timer that is now ticking, and you have the Lawrence Stroll egg timer that is now ticking. If both of those are ticking, Mike Crack has a problem on two fronts, <laughs> and we're about to see how good his management really is because those are hard things to manage. Uh, so, yeah, Aston Martin, uh, so you get the rubbish award from me for on the track. My off track one. I don't know what happened with the weather this weekend, but apparently the weather forecast we were given when we did our preview was really, really bad because I didn't see hardly. I saw lots of rain on Thursday. I did not see any rain Friday, Saturday or Sunday, even though there was necessarily chances of it. But uh, yeah, that was not a harbinger. We we even had a prop bet about wet tires. That was nowhere anywhere in the ballpark. So bad weather forecasts into the rubbish bin with ye as well. All right, so we will move on to our Analysis Paralysis Award. And, uh, Cody, I'd like your your comment here. What you got? My Analysis Paralysis is going to go to uh, shortening the DRS zone here because we already knew before this race uh, that passing is is normally hard at Emila. Um, And maybe it got masked a little bit by the fact that we've had uh, weather come into effect the last few times that we've raced here. But... Don't think shortening the DRS zone was going to do anything to improve uh, raceability here. Uh, we definitely saw that during this race that uh, it was very, very hard to pass. Uh, a lot of uh, you know stagnation for for everyone. Uh, top performing cars like uh, you know Oscar Piastri stuck most of the race. Uh, Sergio Perez in the Red Bull stuck pretty much the whole race. Um, yeah, and. Uh, shortening the DRS zone is definitely not going to help that. Yeah, that felt like a bit of an old goal there. Um, But mine is going to go out to the Mercedes because I'm still not understanding this. So let me get this straight. Mercedes boxes George Russell in order for him to get the fastest lap point, which he then goes out and gets, but it ultimately costs him a driver's standings point because he gave up two points to go behind his teammate. Huh? What? I, I, I like. Why do you not box Lewis Hamilton there if you're going to go for fastest lap? Like, I get it. He had the free gap. I, I said it when we did the review earlier. Like, if this is somehow a Lewis is going to Ferrari thing and we're going to prioritize George, well, you didn't prioritize George. So unless George really didn't think he was going to get to the end, and if that's what it was, maybe that makes sense. But just looking at it on the face of it. That move didn't make any sense to me. I've tried to figure it out. The only thing that makes any sense is like George thought he had a slow puncture and just needed to come in and box because I hope that that's what it is because otherwise this was a 
new one for me, for sure. All right, so we will move into our Dark Horse Award of the weekend. Uh, I think we have consensus here. I'll go first on this one. I'm going to give this one again to Yuki Sonoda. Noticeable in good ways all weekend. The V-Carb cars are doing kind of what we thought they would do, particularly in that Q2 session where he popped up to P3. That was an amazing lap. Uh, It's nice to know he's got the one-lap pace in him. Good on you, Yuki, all weekend. Cody, what you got here? Uh, I am in the same boat as you. I'm going to give my dark horse to Yuki Sonoda. He has continued to to chip in points here on a regular basis for V-Carb. He's now, uh, you know, contributed three quarters of the points that they've gotten and uh, has really kind of put them out on a little bit of an island here. Uh, it's just kind of interesting to see, like, the different uh, islands that are forming for teams and the points here because you now have uh, V-Carb at 20 points. They're 13 points ahead of Haas. Uh, and so, you know, that ki- that type of gap isn't going to be closed up in, you know, a couple races, but they're still quite a ways behind Aston Martin. They're not going to close that gap. So, uh, V-Carb's in a little bit of an island. Uh, Aston Martin, I would say, is a little bit of an island because they're not going to catch Mercedes that quickly. Mercedes is way behind McLaren. So, yeah, I would say that those, uh, those teams, four, five, six, are kind of all islanded out. But, uh, Yuki has been a contributor to, to putting... Uh, v carb well solidified into that uh that p6 uh in the constructors yeah yeah i would agree with all of your comments there uh all right so we will move into our driver of the day i'm going to give this to my boy lando norris because he turned that magical stuff on at the end yet again and gives us hope for the future in a year where we thought max was just going to ride off into the sunset he may have rid off for a couple races but now he has somebody on his heels. Let's see what happens. I'm excited. Uh, I want to see just that little edge more. Seven tenths of a second is enough. We can get there. Come on. <laughs> uh, I also have to give driver of the day to Lando Norris um, because he's done a good job with this race of silencing anyone who thought that uh, his win in Miami was just luck of the safety car. Um, he, he really proved it here that uh, he has the talent and McLaren has the car to take a legitimate fight um, on a race by race basis to Red Bull. And uh, that is that is very exciting because, you know, after the first couple of races were were in the bag here, I thought we were going to see more of the same as last year where Max just wins everything, sets new records. Um, I'm really hope, you know, I got to knock on some wood here. I'm hope I'm not jinxing it and that Max is going to win like the next 15 races. Um, but, uh, there's definitely, uh, definitely hope here that, uh, that Lando and, and McLaren overall can, can, uh, bring us some excitement this year. Yep. Yep. Uh, totally agree with you there. All right. So our predictions ended up almost as close as the race did. Uh, I finished the weekend with five points. I got the pole sitter. I got the P1 podium. Uh, I did really good on the bonus picks. I got P4 for Oscar Piastri. I got P5 uh, for uh, we have uh, there, signs. for signs there. Yep. Uh, and for that. And I got the prop bet because we had dry running and no wet tires. So no blue walled Pirellis on the weekend. Uh, Cody, however, you pipped me just at the end there. Uh, you got the pole sitter. You did well on the lap times. You got the fastest quality time. You got the fastest lap time. And you, sir, swept. The podium, P1, P2, P3, as you had it predicted. Well done again. That's the second time you've done that, I think, this year. So uh, tip of the cap there, sir. That is hard to do. Um, (laughs) But that's what ultimately gets you the victory on the weekend. All right. So that's pretty much the end of our our rundown. Uh, We're going to do a quick Quick turnaround, as they say, like, well, you know, you fill up the car for qualifying, go out and do another run. Uh, that's what we're about to go do, because uh, we've got a very quick turnaround. We've got Monaco happening. The cars are literally in their transportation trucks headed across Europe over to the Monagas region uh, for the Monaco GP. We also have the Indy 500 coming up. We're going to talk about um, we'll do a little Indy car preview to where all those guys are at. Uh, all I have to say is Scott McLaughlin. Damn, dude, that was fast. Yeah. Uh, 234, whatever, average four laps. Like, just when you didn't think it, it couldn't get faster, uh, that went. Well, that dude went out and put it down over there at Indy this weekend for the qualifying. 
Woo! Yeah, um, that's the record too. It was yeah. a very impressive performance. Fastest qualifying ever over four laps, but uh, hell, hell of a thing. Uh, and we'll get into all that. We got to talk a little bit about Team Penske, uh, the Arrow McLaren guys, where they're at, the uh, the uh, the Chip Ganassi Larson? guys, Kyle Larson uh, doing the double and and putting that guy in any sort of car, and he's quick. Uh, kind of an amazing thing. He did the double. Even on, on Sunday, he did a qualifying at Indy, got in a chopper, got on a plane, got in another chopper, went and raced in the All-Star race. And if you want to talk a little bit of NASCAR, we got guys punching each other at the All-Star race, too. So there's a whole lot of uh, tomfoolery going on over there. But uh, anyway, we will talk about a little bit of everything uh, right back in our Monaco preview, which will drop later on this week, uh, once I can finally get all this stuff done for this one. But uh, yeah. Uh, we'll put Imola kind of in the uh, seal bag for now. We'll move on to Monaco. Uh, but, yeah, it was a fun weekend. I always enjoy uh, race cars in your life. Always is a good day. So, um, anyway, we will uh, get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, for Cody, it's been Andy, and we'll catch you in the next one. And, as always, may all your laps be fast.